Greetings and welcome to another Warhammer 40,000 Kill Team video. Today I'm going over the Hand of the Archon Kill Team found in, well, Kill Team Soul Shackle. Before we get into things, please remember to like and subscribe as well as comment. Let me know what you thought of this video and this review as a whole. And remember, I've got a Discord. You can check out in the episode description below as well as a Patreon if you want to give me some more support. Also, thanks goes to Games Workshop for providing this to review for free. And But as always, I aim to be honest, impartial, and constructively critical. So let's get on with the review. So today, this should be my first of three videos um, while I'm at Warhammer World. But they're a bit different than normal because um, depending on when this goes off, uh, well, well, you'll see. You'll see. It's still a full review, just with more interpretations than direct pictures, shall we say. But yeah, this is my standard Warband review, and I'm reviewing the Hand of the Archon, the Drukhari kill team found in the Soul Shackle box for Kill Team, which is the third box for the Into the Dark season. Now, I have done a review on that box in general, but now I'll just go into depth for this Kill Team as a whole. So getting into the roster for the Hand of the Archon, they have the archetype of Recon, Security, and Seek and Destroy. For this kill team, before I got it, it actually looks at the Compendium version of Drukhari, and effectively, if you went pure Cabalites, you only had Recon and Security. So they've added Seek and Destroy, which is nice. It basically gives them all the good archetypes in the game sans infiltration. So that's really good there. You've got your leader, which is the Cabalite Arch Cyberite, who can either have a Blast Pistol and Venom Blade, or then Splinter Pistols with either Venom Blade, Agonize, or Power Weapon, or you can also just give them a Splinter Rifle, and then you can take eight other Acolyte, well, Cabalites, and, uh, including a Gunner and Heavy Gunner, but you can only include each one once apart from your General Agent. So, you know, it's this nine operative kill team which seems to be the standard for well Eldari in general considering the Corsairs were nine and now well the Drukhari Cabalites Hand of the Archon are nine you know you've got Harlequins who are eight but they're more of a weird spot but that's that's not so bad for the roster I think that's a decent roster which makes more sense when you see the rest of the kill team going into the faction tac ops they have three and they're kind of not great in my opinion so the first one is Pay the Soldier, it's Faction Tack Op 1. Reveal this the first time a friendly operative gains a pain token, and then you start a soul debt tally, adding one each time your operative gains a pain to token, including the first time they do. If your soul debt tally is 7 or more, you get a victory point. If it's 9 or more, you get a second victory point. Considering that it's not too easy getting these, well, you see in a minute, it's not great, and I think they looked at, oh, you know, Grand Act for the Boy Dancer Troop was too much. Let's just uh, make it more balanced, but in a way worse. Uh, then you've got Slaver on, which is Faction Tack Op 2. You reveal this the first time an enemy operative is incapacitated. Each time an enemy operative is incapacitated, before it's removed from the kill zone, you place a slave token underneath it as close as possible to the center of the base. Friendly operatives can perform their pickup action on the token while not within engagement range, but then you subtract white from their movement while they're carrying it. And at the end of the battle, if you control two or more, you get a victory point. And if you control four or more, you gain another victory point. Considering, you know, you're not the most fragile, you're not the most durable of kill teams, and it also penalizes your movement. I don't think I would ever take Slave Run unless I was playing like a thematic game. It's just not good. And then we've got Contempt to Slaughter, which is Faction Tack Op 3. You can reveal this at the end of any turning point. At the end of any turning point, if one of my enemy operatives was incapacitated during that turning point and no friendly operatives were incapacitated, you score a victory point. And then if you do it again, you gain another. And uh, you cannot score these conditions in a turning point in which no friendly <laughs> hand of the Archon operatives in the kill zone. So if you're wiped out, you can't score it. It's really weird. I can potentially see you getting one victory point from this during turning point one and then maybe turning point four if you've won the game so this is really not good like all together these faction tack ops kind of suck but the good thing is they basically can select all the good archetypes so i guess guess that's a payoff oddly the most reliable is probably faction tack or one paid the soul debt but even then like it's not great 
So now we get onto the faction ability of this kill team. So for the Hand of the Archon, they don't have the free dash every time they activate. They actually have power from pain like they do in the Drukari Codex. So this triggers each time a friendly operative incapacitates an enemy operative with five or more wounds, they gain a pain token. If you kill someone with 11 or more wounds, you gain two pain tokens instead. You can spend these pain tokens for invigorations when the condition is met. For each pain token you spend, you remove it from the operative with the exception of stimulated senses, which can only be used once per activation. I mean, outside of stimulated senses. But basically, you've got Dark Animus, which when your op operative is act activated, they can spend a pain token to get plus one APL. Then you've got Vitalized Surge, which they can perform a free dash action after killing someone, even if they've charged. And then the last one, Stimulated Senses, is after rolling an attack or defense dice, you can spend a pain token to reroll. I don't know, these, these abilities aren't great considering you don't start with any pain tokens yet yeah, it's very reminiscent of how the first fourth edition drukari codex worked or was it fifth edition but still if like you know the good thing is you can get multiple pain tokens from killing like someone with 11 or more wounds they're basically a marine but the problem is they're not really that great the most useful is probably dark animus but even then it's incredibly situational and what I would have preferred is something how the current codex does it, where you get stacking effects every turning point, because say you don't get any kills until turning point three, you're not going to use any of your abilities. And even when you kill someone, the best you're going to be able to do is vitalize surged or stimulated senses when you're next attacked. It's really wonky. It's, it's almost a win more effect in terms of you can't plan to use it. You can just go, oh, it's a nice bonus. I'm still alive and I'll use it. But... You know, that's what it is. So for the strategic ploys, they can spend a command point for blade artists until the end of the turning point. Melee weapons from this kill team gain rending, which is actually pretty good. Then you've got fleet of foot. So each time you perform a normal move or da uh, fall back, you can do a dash action after that activation or vice versa, which I assume they mean before. So you can spend a command point to be a fast Eldari, which is weird but i guess we all start with an extra command point so it's not too bad and then you've got from darkness death until the end of the turning point each time a friendly operative is activated you can select one enemy operative that is not within line of sight of that operative or enemy operative until the end of the activation the first time that friendly operative fights in combat or makes a shooting attack against them in the roll attack die step you can retain one successful hit as a crit instead so this really rewards you actually completely hiding outside of line of stri uh, line of sight and then oh, fighting someone or shooting someone. But this is actually really useful because it's actually really hard for your opponent to stop. And when you've got stuff like Blade Artist up, you can just guarantee crits as long as you can get a hit, which is really strong, really, really strong. And then you've got Denzins of the Night, which is for one command point till the end of the turning point, while friendly operatives have a conceal order, is within blue of your drop zone and more than red from enemy operatives. They are always treated as having a conceal order regardless of other rules, which is basically super conceal. And while it has a lot of stipulations because you have to be further away, the good thing about it is you can basically be super safe turning point one unless someone bomb rushes you with a grenade or two. Overall, like it's really nice defensive play and allows you to set up safely for turning point two and even three. So overall, really good strategic ploys. For tactical ploys, you have Cruel Deception. So use this when a friendly operative is activated until the end of that activation. That operative can fall back for one AP less to a minimum of zero. It's not bad. It's more of like a very niche scenario where someone tries to charge block you. But it's not bad. It's a nice toolbox ploy. Then you've got Devious Scheme, which is similar to, you know, Vect. Agents of Vect. Use this tactical ploy after an opponent uses a tactical ploy or strategic ploy. The next time they would use that ploy, it costs one additional command point. And then at this point, the effect ends. And you can't use this tactical ploy again until the effect is ended. So it's weird, right? It's like, you may not use this at all. It's very strange. Some matchups, it, it's basically going to be coming down to your matchups and how much CP your opponent has access to. Like against the stronger kill teams who get free ploys or free command points, 
is not that useful, but it's really good against those that aren't and regularly use their strats. So the only problem is if you use it and then your opponent just decides not to use that strat, you've just... But even then, if they're not and it's something they want to use, you've spent a CP to stop them spending the CP, which is good. Then you've got heinous arrogance. When it's your turn to activate a readily operative, you can spend a command point to skip. Now, I know a lot of people have been going crazy about this, but I don't think it's that good. It's very situational, but you kind of want to spend most of your CP on your strategic ploys. You know, there are situations maybe during turning point one where this would be good, but, you know, it's it's more of a very situational tool book toolbox stratagem is that something you'd use all the time then you've got prey on the wounded which is a better version of the compendium strat use this tactical ploy after rolling attack dice for a combat shooting attack made by a friendly operative if the target has half or few of its wounds remaining you can uh, in shooting or combat you can reroll any or all of your attack dice so before it used to be roll up to two dice now you basically get relentless which is really good when you're trying to ensure kills which can happen quite often in kill team for I'll, I'll show a generalized picture if i don't then you know i've got my box on time but for the operative the operatives in general for the hand of the archon everyone has free uh free white movement two apl free defense a four up save and eight wounds so that's the general body right so that's the eldari body of a kill team you know in for, for kill team so first up you've got your cabalite art sarabite so to differ from that they have nine wounds. So as I said, they can either have a blast pistol and venom blade or splinter pistol and a different amount of weapons. But the blast pistol and venom blade is clearly the best in my opinion. The blast pistol lets you hit on freeze with four or five damage. AP2 is range red, uh, but your venom blade is four attacks hitting on twos, four four with lethal four up, which is nice. I mean, you could go with a splinter pistol that hits on twos and then take a power weapon, which is... 4-6, lethal 5 up, or an agonizer, which is 3-6, brutal, lethal 5 up, and reap 1. Probably you would go the agonizer if you weren't taking the venom blade. But generally, you want the extra gun over a better close combat piece. If you were 5 attack, sure, but you're only 4. But the other key thing outside of the loadout is he has a... Well, they have a special ability called cunning. In the strategic phase, when it's your turn to play a, f a ploy... If you pass the foot in your first opportunity, you gain one command point. So this is actually hilarious, right? So it's better if you're going first, but even if you're going second, it's still good because it's your turn. If your first thing is to pass and you know your opponent is definitely going to play two stratagems or one and you're going first, you're now guaranteed one command point. Even during turning point one, you could just pass and gain another command point so it's very strong and the thing is it's not just once per game it's every turning point so especially in turning points two on three two or three where you know your opponent is going to be spending multiple strategic ploys this is amazing so definitely don't kit your leader out for melee you want that blast pistol to to punish and get sne sneaky kills you want your leader as alive as long as possible and then he has the unique action which all Cabalite Hander, the Archons have if they have a splinter rifle, which is the same as the Corsair or the Void Guard Corsair, where if they take an if they spend an action point to aim, as long as they are not within blue of enemy operatives, they get balanced on their their rifles. So, you know, that's not really that great, but it's there for some reason. Next, you've got the Cabalite Agent, which is your general warrior with the same profile. They have splinter rifles, which are four attacks, hitting on freeze. 2-4 with lethal 5 up, exactly the same as the Compendium. And they have an array of blades, which is free attacks, hitting on freeze, free 4 and they can take aim. So, you know, it's not free 4 with rending, but I think I prefer 2-4 lethal 5 up. It's a really nice twist on their poison weapons and actually makes them quite a threat, especially at stuff with 7 wounds and a 5 up save. Even 4 up saves are going to struggle to survive a volley from Cabalites. And you can just spend an action point to gain balance, which is not necessarily bad. Next up, you've got your Cabalite Duelist. So this is the operative with like one of the uh, like flex swords from the Drukhari Witches. I forget what it's called. A Razor Flail there. Instead of Razor Flails, you have one. Exactly the same profile, but it has a Splinter Pistol and Razor Flail, which is four attacks hitting on twos, four five with Brutal and Flail. So Flail is each time this operative fights in combat in... 
every time you parry, you can parry two hits instead of one. So it's basically like a storm shield, well, a shield that you hit really hard with. And then brutal display. Each time you incapacitate an enemy operative in combat, select one other visible enemy operative within red of this operative or the operative you incapacitated till the start of the next turning point. They can't do mission actions. They can't do pickup actions and they can't control objectives. And when you combine this with its special action, Crimson Assault, you perform a free fight action with this operative after completing that action and the fight sequence. If you're still within engagement range of an enemy operative, you can fight again immediately, but you do not have to pick the same target. So you can charge two people and effectively kill two. It's really powerful. And then you're triggering Brutal Display twice. So you could charge into a point with like four guardsmen on it, kill two guardsmen of it on it, and now you've just controlled that point. It's crazy. Really good. Like this is one of the best operatives. It's so fragile, but man, you want to you definitely want this to charge into points and just murder stuff. Next, you've got the Cabalite disciple of Yelindra, who is the operative with the floating grenades. So uh, to much surprise, it doesn't come with free grenades. It comes with super grenades. Well, torment grenades. So they have a Stinger Pistol and Array of Blades. So the Stinger Pistol is five attacks, zero, zero damage, range red with Stinger. Now, the weird thing about this is you roll your dice and then for every dice that is less than the target save characteristic, you do a Mortal Wound. So if someone had a five up armor save, for every one, uh, two, three or four, you would do a Mortal Wound. But if for every roll of a natural one, you do three Mortal Wounds. So you kind of really want to roll incredibly badly. So this is great at basically punishing low low wound operatives. They don't get any defense, it's just straight mortal wounds. And then if you kill someone with this, everyone within white suffers D3 mortal wounds as well. So it's actually really good at targeting someone who's injured and then causing this mortal wound bomb. It is only range red, but it's really nice. But the best thing about this operative are its torments grenades. So you select one point within red of this operative and roll a dice for every one or every uh, or every operative within white of that point. So add one to the result if they have a save characteristic of four or worse. So if they have a save of four, five or six and then subtract one if they're not visible. So if you can't see them, you're minus one on a free up. That operative is poisoned until the end of the battle and operatives can only be poisoned once. At the end of each turning point, poison operatives suffer two mortal wounds. Poison operatives are treated as being injured regardless of any other rules that say they cannot be injured. So this is super injury. Like you, you move up conceal and then you throw this within raid and effectively anyone within eight inches on a four up or five up, even three up is going to take two mortal wounds and then be super injured. Really, really powerful. Like you can do crazy things with this operative. Like it would mess up stuff like Galapox infected. Even Marines don't like this because they will count as being injured, although they're basically only affected on a four up, but really powerful, really like this. Next, you have the Cabalite Elixicant. So this is not your medic, but kind of is in a weird way. So there's a guy with the big stim gun. So he has a splinter rifle somewhere and a stim needler, which is four attacks, hitting on freeze, no damage, range blue, lethal free up with stun and then an array of blades. So it's combat drugs. If this operative is selected for deployment, select one of the following abilities for your kill team to gain until the end of the battle. You can choose Painbringer, which gives operatives a six up DPR. So every time they suffer a wound on a six up, you ignore that. Or Hypex, which gives black to all their movement. So you, you pick black, so you're super fast. And then you've got administer drug for one action point. You select an operative visible and within blue, and you either heal D3 plus one wounds from them, or you change their combat drugs for the rest of the game. I mean, you're taking this guy to give everyone plus one movement, and then he might heal someone. It's that's that's the play. He's amazing because he makes everyone faster. Always take him. So next, you've got the Cabalite Flayer, who is the guy with the rack mask and weapons. So he has pain sculptures, which are four attacks, not five for some reason. Hitting on freeze, free five with relentless and flay. So flay is each time this operative fights in combat with this weapon. The first time it strikes an operative with a critical hit, select one friendly operative within red of this operative to gain a pain token. 
which isn't bad. And he's got insensible to pain. So each time this operative fights in combat or a shooting attack is made against it, you subtract one from all damage it takes from both characteristics to a minimum of one, which is, wow, that's uh, quite powerful, especially stuff against guardsmen. Literally, Laz guns will do one damage, maybe two against it. Crazy. Actually, like, it's not bad. I would have loved it if it had five attacks. As it stands, you're kind of, you know, with f on four dice, you have effectively like a 51.3% chance to roll a crit. Would Relentless it rises a bit more? But I would have liked five attacks with like Ceaseless or something. Four with Relentless is fine, but it's three five. And I'm like, he's, he's okay, but it's not amazing. Then you've got your Cabalite Gunner who can either have a Blaster or a Shredder. And that you'd basically take depending on your opponent. If they're an elite team, you take a Blaster because it has five, six AP2. Or you take a Shredder because it has five dice instead of four with three, four and Blast White. We're rending now. So even better. So it, it, it's, a, it's your nice toolbox operative, just like with Corsairs, but now on a 25 mil base. Then you have the Heavy Gunner, who can either have a Dark Lance, which hits on freeze with four dice, six, seven, AP2 Heavy and Unwieldy, or a Splinter Cannon, which is five dice, hitting on freeze, three, five, with Fusillade, Heavy and Lethal five up. I think generally you go with the Splinter Cannon, although I am quite fond of taking the Dark Lance against Elites because... You know, doesn't fire turning point one, but turning point one, you get him into position and turning point two, if he sees like a marine or anything in the open, they effectively die. So not bad there and oddly more usable than the Corsair Heavy Gunner. Then finally, you have your Cabalite Sky Splinter Assassin. So this is the guy with the bird. So the cool thing is it has a razor wing. It doesn't have a flock of them, just has one. So it has five dice, hitting on fours, one, two damage, indirect, no cover, and silent. Then as a shard carbine, which, you know, I kind of realized the moment I saw it, because it's the same as what the scourges have. So four dice, hitting on threes, two, two, ceaseless, lethal five up with mortal wounds two. So it's effectively a splinter rifle that does mortal wounds instead with ceaseless. So technically better, I would say and then an array of blades. But the cool thing about this operative is all the special rules it has. So first it says it has Omen. So in the select equipment step, you can select one enemy operative or another friendly operative, and you reveal your selection during when you select equipment. Each time an attack or defense dice is rolled for that operative, if it's an enemy operative, they must reroll results of six. If it's a friendly operative, you can reroll results of one. You basically always take this against enemy operatives, especially ones that have anything that trigger on sixes, namely like snipers with mortal wounds on crits, stuff like that. Because even if they have a lucky save on a six in our rerolls, you ha it has the special rule hunter. So as long as this operative doesn't perform the mark action uh, during its activation, it can perform two shoot actions during its activation. And you must select the razor wing as one of them, but it basically allows you to fire the bird and fire the gun, which is nice. Then you have the mark action. Select one enemy operative visible to this operative that is not more than white higher than them. Until the end of the turning point, while that enemy operative is not in cover from heavy terrain, this operative treats as having an engage order. This operative cannot perform the action while with an engagement range of enemy operative or an action in which it makes a shooting attack with a razor wing. So effectively, if someone's in light cover and you can see them, you can spend an action point and just basically go, you're in the open now. So the best bird in the game, you know, because you basically do this and then you shoot them with a blaster and laugh. Crazy. Really, really powerful. Powerful for like, you know, sometimes you may want to fire the shard carbine and the razor wing, but generally I think you're just going to want to move up and mark stuff. You know, the downside is you can't stay and conceal, use the razor wing and then mark someone. But that's the fair trade off considering the bird doesn't really do much. You know, it's got unlimited range, which is great, um, but generally marking is going to be crazy with this kill team. And then for equipment, equipment actually isn't too bad here. You can take a plasma grenade, which is four dice hitting on freeze, three, four, you know, same blast white. So super frag grenade effectively. They have phantasm grenade launchers, which you can only take one of. So you select a point within red of this operative and roll for a D6 for every operative within blue. 
uh, subtracting one if they're not visible. On a four up, they have minus one APL, and you can only do this once. But for a th such a huge range of an effect range, it's really good. You've got a banner, which you can only take one of, which allows you to count as one APL, how APL higher for objectives, which is good. You can get chain snares, which punish people from trying to fall back. Wicked blades, which give everyone plus one attack if they have an array of blades. Then you have toxic coating, where you can select a melee operative, um, a we melee weapon an operative is equipped with, gains the lethal five up rule, which is really strong. It costs one equipment point for array of blades and two for everything else. So you generally put this on stuff like your actual good melee operatives. And then you've got refined poison. So you either select one of the splinter weapons and add one to the damage characteristics until the end of the battle. It's only two equipment if you spend it on a pistol or rifle, otherwise it costs three. But I don't think you're generally going to take refined poison. It's more expensive than it was before, but not my recommendation. Uh, I think I just probably focused on the Wicked Blades, maybe the Banner, definitely a, a Plasma Grenade, and probably a Phantasm. Like, the really cool thing is how much, how many ways this kill team has to mess with APL. It's really nice. And then, in addition, you get a nice selection of narrative rules for everything you want to use in narrative play for this kill team. So overall, uh, this kill team is, I think, really, really good. They seemed very underwhelming at first. Like, when I saw them in the preview, I was like, I like the models, but this stuff is probably going to be bad. And then when I saw the rules, I think they're really, really good. Their biggest weakness is their faction tac ops and how CP reliant they are. But otherwise, they have so many tricks and tools. Like, they're crazy. I think they're going to be really good. And that's really happy because I was like, they basically play how I wanted the Corsairs to be. So this is awesome. But I'll quickly do the pros and cons, right? And then I'll go more in depth. So for the pros, you know, I like that they're like, they still look great because they're the Jez Goodwin Drukari models. So, you know, that was one of my favorite range refreshes and i still love the new drukari aesthetic all the operatives feel unique thematic and powerful and it's really something that i think even operatives that don't actually offer much combat prowess actually buff the kill team as a whole while still being thematically linked to the kill team instead of just being gameplay strong then they also have a lot of tools and ways to punish the opponent from multiple act at like angles so it's really hard for your opponent to predict who you're going to attack and depending on who you attack, how you get bonuses from. And they're really good at, you know, picking off key operatives. And the other thing is they have a great tack op selection in terms of being able to se select between seek and destroy info, info, no, well, being able to see select between seek and destroy security and recon really powerful selections. The only thing they don't get is infiltration, which isn't bad for their cons. They are only an upgrade sprue, even though I like the upgrade sprue, but that will annoy some people. The faction tack ops are very not good. I think faction tack op one has some game, but generally they seem really punishing, especially the ones that require you to capture slaves. I get the idea behind it, but I find it too punishing. And the kill team is still quite fragile, right? Everyone has a four up save and basically eight wounds. And then power from pain really doesn't feel great for a faction ability. I think it's more of a win more in, in terms of you don't plan to use it. You're like, if your operative survives and you go like, oh, cool, my operative survived and I got to activate them so I can do these cool abilities. I would have preferred how the codex did it where you have an effect turning point one and then you get another stacking effect turning point two, three and four. I think that would have been better than this because... As I said, if you have a bad turn uh, or even game and don't start getting kills until turning point three, you're in a situation where you're not really using your faction ability or even in a scenario where you are killing early, those operatives then immediately die. You're still not seeing any benefit from your faction ability, which is disappointing. But overall, I, I think this kill team is great. I'm really happy that it's good because i actually have a lot of drukari i have a drukari army and i was actually using some of the trueborn i've got to fill out this kill team 
Like I, I honestly have like 60 tabloids or more. It's really cool. Like this kill team seems so much fun. I'm definitely going to stick with it and try. I think they're great at destroying Marines. I think they're going to struggle against larger kill teams because they actually don't have that much AOE, but they actually do well at fighting weaker kill teams, like in terms of stuff with the seven wounds and a five or four up save. So I'm very interested to see how they play out. You know, I've been wanting a really strong, but kind of tricksy Eldari team that wasn't Harlequins. Like these feel like how Corsairs should have been, but better. And also they're on 25 mil bases. So I'm really hyped about this kill team. I'm going to get them fully painted up when I get my books and yeah, start dishing them out. I can't wait to now properly go. It's Drukari time. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Please remember to like and subscribe as well as comment. Let me know what you thought of this review. Do you agree or disagree? Are you all as hyped for the Drukari Hand of the Archon as I am? Or are you indifferent? And, you know, if you want, you can check out my Discord in the episode description below for my Discord for free, as well as a Patreon if you want to give me some more support. And I've also got an affiliate link to Element Games, which you can check out in the episode description below, which will net you a 15 to 25% discount at no additional cost to yourself while hoping to support the channel and me. But yeah, I'll quickly thank my patrons. So for my adults of the crew, I have Samaru, Screech, Sam, Sam, Robin, Ninjali83, Nick, Kenzie, John Thomas, Eric, Captain Murder, Daniel, Average Joe27, Arthur, and Samja. So thank you so much. Your support really means a lot to me and helps the channel so much. But yeah, this is one of my reviews. So I basically have a day to edit it. So it's going to be fun. Hope you guys enjoy it. But um, no, yeah, this is really cool. I really like this kill team. I'm so happy. Like, so happy. I'm currently at Warhammer World. If you're watching this on the day it comes out. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I am super hyped for the Hand of the Archon. Going to paint up my own full kill team and it's going to be great. I'm going to capture slaves and do what the Drukhari best. So remember, no matter how much of your kill team gets captured by Drukhari raiders to become slaves in their arena or whatever in the dark city of Komara, remember, there should always be a chance as long as you can roll a crit.